Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining this July Knowledge Cafe from uh, for KM for Dev. Uh, today we have three speakers with us, and that is uh, Sarah Cummings, who is a uh, researcher and consultant on the Knowledge Society and international development. Uh, moreover, she's also an expert with uh, Wageningen uh, University and Research in the Netherlands. There too, we also have uh, Gladys uh, Kemboy, who is a KM and program analyst with uh, Life in Abundance International and an uh, editorial board member with uh, KM for Development Journal. And lastly, we have uh, Charles Dewa, who is with Knowledge Trans Africa uh, from Harare in Zimbabwe. Uh, he is um, among that, he's also an uh, international recognized expert within uh, knowledge management. All, moreover, all three uh, speakers are also very active key members of the KM for Development community. The uh, session today, it'll be uh, approximately an hour and a half long. We'll uh, have a few presentations from th 3 to 3.40, uh, where the first breakout session will happen. And 15 minutes later, we'll go over the second one. Uh, following up with a uh, discussion in plenary and a wrap up for the next cafe. A little bit about, thank you for that, <laughs> a little bit about uh, the session today. Um, as said, uh, Gladys, Sarah and Charles, they'll be our uh, speakers and they'll be uh, sharing current perspectives on knowledge related, uh, also uh, called epistemic justice. Um, and instead of the, fo the common focus on understanding the multitude of epistemic injustices, Gladys, Sarah, and uh, Charles will share uh, some exciting and brand new uh, perspectives on knowledge-related justice, um, which will also help us in our uh, efforts to uh, counteract injustices in international development, uh, such as not listening to uh, communities and marginalizing local, um, local knowledge. Um, I hope that covers it. Um, if not, then uh, by all means, Sarah, you're uh, very welcome to uh, tie in where I uh, missed a beat. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Jacob. I hope you can all hear me okay. It's really great to be presenting this with uh, the dream team of Gladys and Charles with support from you, Jacob, and Rocio. Um, this paper is uh, based on a paper we've been working on um, and, it, you know, epistemic justice is a concept which is really theoretical, and we've been trying to make this theory more action-oriented. And this is a paper I'm writing with Gladys Charles and Stacey Young, so people who I'm sure are well-known to many of you. And this is a really nice opportunity to consult Ken for Dev and friends. And actually, it's a new innovation where going to be having a session tomorrow morning for half an hour where we'll be feeding back what happens today um, with the real KM magazine and Bruce Boyce you know so that we're in a more friendly time zone for people in Asia, Oceania and Australia. So here we go from epistemic injustice to epistemic justice. So, so what is epistemic justice? It's a form of injustice based on the intersectional identity of knowledge holders. So what are examples of these in um, international development, as Jacob said, um, not listening to, not listening to communities, seeing communities as a source of data, but not recognizing them as knowledge holders, like we all are as individuals. And I think maybe one of the most commonly um, recognized example is, for example, when women talk about sexual assault, it's very common that, you know, they're not really being believed, which is quite unusual if you're a victim of a crime. And the whole idea of uh, Miranda um, of epistemic injustice was introduced by Miranda Fricker in publications from 2007 onwards. And she uses an example then from the famous US novel To Kill a Mockingbird, um, where the the, one of the main protagonists, Tom Robinson, isn't believed because he's he's a black man and he's eventually killed. So in these um, in epistemic justice, you have individual and collective epistemic justice. So it's something that affects individuals, but also collectives and communities. 
And I think it's common, commonly understood that can totally ruin people's lives. And also that it's really important. Um, but here you see a quote from uh, Bonaventura de Souza Santos saying there's no global justice without global epistemic justice. And there's a huge amount of research on this subject. It's a really blooming subject and we are adding to the hype if you like. But so here's a sort of overview of what intersectional means. So for example, race and class, language, culture, ethnicity and gender, age, ability and sexuality are all things that can interact to give different and different types of uh, epistemic injustice. So one of the things we started doing was um, trying to map out the literature on epistemic injustices. And, um, you know, if you see here, it's all very complicated. I'm not going to explain all of it. But like one of the most common ones is testimonial injustice, which has been proposed by Miranda Fricker, which is that uh, people aren't believing you because of identity, identity prejudice. But an, another one she talks about is homonotic injustice, which means that the sort of knowledge tools aren't available to, to support your perspective um, on uh, development, for example, or other subjects. But when I was mapping, when we were mapping out the literature, one of the things that really hit me really was epistemic network injustice, which is not having access to the right networks, which will support you in your your capacity as a knower. And that really, that really resonated with me because of the way Gladys talks about our community care for Dev, because she made me really understand this, that actually not having access to the right types of network as young people can really, really be detrimental to your development. And, and in the, and one of the things we did, we had the framework, there's a generally accepted framework of individual and collective injustices and what we also did was try to map systemic injustices into this framework um, looking at different literature and most of this is quite philosophical literature but there is increasingly literature on this subject for example in the field of education information sciences but also um, in development and we we sort of looking at the literature we have put within the framework the just linguistic injustices and you you know in in development literature you see or in practice you see lots of lots of discussion about translation about the role of language and that sort of thing in particularly community communicating with local um, communities but also for example the fact that English as a lingua franca excludes many non-English speakers or people for whom it's a second language. The other aspect is coloniality of knowledge. So, you know, the background in colon coloniality, which I've got to slide on next. But one of the things that really struck me was the discussion on um, epistemicide, which is death of knowledge, and actually, which is very much related, I think, to coloniality and colonialism. And one of the things that really struck me, it's not really only death of knowledge, but also devaluing knowledge. And that's a phenomenon that we see quite common, commonly, I think. Um, and a further thing that comes out of curricular, out of the educational field is curricular injustice. So the curricula not supporting different perspectives on knowledge or different types of knowledge. And I think this is a useful addition also as a systemic epistemic justice. I hope you're all following this. Um, okay, so one of the main causes I think is coloniality, which is defined as the entrenched power dynamics and patterns of knowledge creation that have emerged from the historical power relations of colonial domination. And here you also see uh, a quote from Torres, which I particularly like because it shows, um, it shows, for example, how it's maintained alive in books, in criteria for academic performance, in aspirations, but also that it's really, we breathe it and it is also very much part of the knowledge system. I'd just like to ask if, if you're maybe mute actually, or maybe you could mute us, Jacob, because I, maybe it's... So, so what did we think were the problems with epistemic injustice? So what we were really thinking was, you know, 
it's not necessarily a problem in a sense, but it is very philosophical. And I think it has really, that gives it a lot of value. And it's, you know, looking at the very, you know, trying to understand these multiple injustices, but it's not very, at the moment, it's not very action orientated. It's understanding, not, not bring, bringing about change. And the other thing we thought that it doesn't really sufficiently recognize the misery and suffering caused by it. And I really like this quote that I found from a journalist. If our voices are essential aspects of our humanity, to be rendered voiceless is to be dehumanized or excluded from one's humanity. And I think, you know, maybe there's perhaps not also not, we think there's also maybe not enough recognition of the fact that, you know, if you're not being believed, if you're not being believed as a, as a knowledge holder, you know, you could actually die because of courts, for example, or, you know, the misery caused by epistemicide. And in the literature, people are talking about like first and second degree harms, but also third harms, intergenerational harms. So what we tried to do was develop a new framework. So what we did, we developed a new framework of epistemic justices, which I just showed you, which includes systemic epistemic injustices. But we tried to build a new framework of epistemic justice because, you know, we thought this might be more forward looking, but it's less conceptually developed. So we sort of used a reflection, if you like, of epistemic injustices. So here we have, I haven't, we haven't covered them all, but here you can see an overview of some of the epistemic justices, individual and collective, and what that means to um, us as KM practitioners. So for, for example, we, we a mirror image of testimonial injustice is testimonial justice, which is attributing credibility to a testimony without identity prejudice on the hearer's part. And things like that are things like, um, you know, ways we can do that or deep listening, um, trying to understand what people are talking about and also trying to pe pay attention to the knowledge, for example, of marginalized groups. Um, hermeneutic justice then is the, if you like, the reflection of hermeneutic injustices. And this is creation of su sufficient tools and methodologies to understand marginalized groups. So this involves, you know, for us, that's creation of new tools and terminologies, which, you know, is part of really KM practitioners work, but also supporting the capabilities of others. So epistemic ne network justice is um, providing access to networks which support individuals and communities and knowledge holders. And it means that providing access to peers, access to networks, and access to social capital. And I think um, just after me, Gladys is gonna be talking about the role of care for Dev in mentoring, for example. And another thing is, so epistemic justice of the interpretive burden um, means that individuals are not necessarily affected by epi epistemic injustices being, should be, have a responsibility to make these clear on the behalf of on behalf of others. So not only leaving the marginalized groups to speak up, but we also should try and help them in this perspective. And I think this is, you know, what a lot of our community are to trying to do for um, local communities. Um, then you have linguistic justice, which, which will involve, um, which means being aware of the power dynamics of language and in international development. Um, so this involves funding for translation and new organizational policies to look towards local languages. Um, decolonization of knowledge involves new practices that dis disrupt currently unequal power relations as they relate to knowledge, you know, to really try to dismantle the ones coming from our colonial past. Um, another one which we came across in the literature was indigeneity, which is, if you like, a subsection of the subset of the decolonization of knowledge and it's been proposed by Canadian indigenous artists curators and organizers as a process of recentering aesthetic and political indigenous structures and I think one example of this is which you can also see as a form of hermeneutic justice like a new tool or terminology is work that Charles 
is doing on indigenous African commerce, which is a phenomenon that has really been um, very much ignored in the literature and which is really fundamental to uh, you know, African societies, which Charles will be talking about in a second, and curricular justice. So really a holistic, realistic understanding of development based on contextual and empowering ideas emanating from an indigenous cultures. But in terms of practices, this can be, you know, analysis of who's being cited, for example. Um, but you know, as you see, this is, we don't make, you know, we need to work on what this actually means, I think. So here you see um, an overview of the framework we developed. So you see individual collective justice, systemic, systemic epistemic justice. And um, I think in this area, new tools and terminologies, intentional creation of new tools and terminology, which is this is something where we as KM practitioners and researchers can make a big difference. And epistemic network justice is really like networks like KM for Dev should be supporting, making a conscious effort to support, um, for example, young people or professionals, and also indigeneity, which is, you know, um, forms of ter terminologies and perspectives from an indigenous perspective need to be more better understood and introduced in our terms and concepts. So thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to now hand over to Gladys, who's going to talk about uh, Care for Deaf as network justice. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, regarding the network justice, as uh, Sarah shared, it revolves around uh, where, especially the young people, uh, speaking from African perspective, um, who lacks the mentors, uh, those who are doing knowledge management, perhaps, and even um, they don't have access to networks or groups where they can be nurtured and mentored to address various um, sustainable development goals and to address issues that they are affecting them, especially um, when you look at this from sharing from the Kenyan perspective and how my experience, so like when I was growing in this, um, my career journey until uh, I joined the camp for the how uh, it has created opportunities also for many young people, including me, having access to mentors and be nurtured and also we have seen uh, transformation. Um, many young people, especially those from the marginalized communities or groups, have been excluded by the structures of power, status quo, and uh, privileges because um, even they don't have access to these members and to be supported. Others, like in most of the networks, especially those professional networks, um, majority we don't have room for the young people. It's only for the elderly and uh, those with big titles, the expertise, and they then ex exclude these young people and even they lack mentorship program. Um, I love the approach of Game for Dev, how they have created this safe space and also to nurture and support the younger generation. And we have uh, came for the we have um, various mentorship programs, and also in addition to that, where we can join various networks. Like uh, one of them is. Um, being part of the editorial board at KM for Dev, I think uh, from my experience uh, coming from Kenya and being the first young person to join the board, it's only for mostly professors or those with big titles like the doctors. And it has changed the narrative. And also I've seen other now uh, looking at the, um, the work of the KM for Dev, how it's going on. It has changed the narrative and other, other professional networks here in Kenya, they have created a, uh, um, programs for the young people because it's shaping the narrative from the global to even at locally. Um, in addition to that, uh, even for me and other young people to join camp for them and to support, uh, to be supported and also getting access to various mentors. Uh, we have seen the contribution um, and even from different parts of the uh, African countries, which have had an opportunity to interact with some from um, um, West Africa and also in parts of the East African countries. Um, uh, other opportunities, like even for research, many young people, especially those who are still uh, in campus like pursuing masters, they've been having challenges on how to do their research and they don't have access to mentors or now to guide them in this. 
and most of them have been lacking behind. Uh, we are grateful to Camp for Dev. They have created also an opportunity where we have a group of researchers, and every time you need support, Camp for Dev is always there to support you and to take you through in this. I am proud of Camp for Dev to say, yeah, it's a, it has become a home for me and many other young people uh, uh, who have been looking for a network where they can be supported without any critique. Uh, but yeah, they are there to nurture you and to guide you. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, so through this initiative last year, uh, Camp for Dev, uh, we worked together during, it was part of the, the agenda, we were focusing on decolonization of knowledge and addressing various uncomfortable truths. And uh, we've seen the outcome of the sessions. We have the Camp for Dev Youth Leadership Forum, and this is a forum um, which supports young people. We have um, different stakeholders. These are people who are working in different organizations in the development sectors with different experiences and uh, to unnerves and expand their expertise. And also including in supporting young people in terms of the innovations, being supported in terms of their talents and ideas to promote knowledge uh, for sustainable development goals. As you have seen um, in the chat there, based on various countries, uh, the participation of these uh, knowledge cafes and also contribution of the young people. If you see from the graph, yeah, you see Kenya is leading with around 108 participants. So it shows how the influence of Camp for Dev is really making changes in various countries. And we are so grateful about this, followed by France, Uganda, India, Sudan, USA, Zimbabwe, Italy, Mexico, and Malaysia, among other countries. Um, we have the forum, it's always open for all of us. Uh, next, we are having also another forum coming this Akasti for the Youth Dialogue, which is part of the contribution of the Camp for Dev, um, including other stakeholders that are supporting this initiative for the young people. I would like to read something which uh, Charles, they were uh, shared some years back about um, about creating sustainable uh, pathways. Uh, like it was in 2019 when Charles shared about um, that year uh, in, in the D group of Camp for Dev. And here is what he shared. A major challenge um, he seems to notice in poor developing and developed countries is absence of clear knowledge based succession pathways especially within uh, organizations and government and a cabinet or a parliament whose members are over 70 years and above cannot realistically imagine and talk about the vision 2030 without, uh, or even 2063 without involving young people who will be alive by then. And many development organizations are not immune to this challenge. And according to Charles, uh, he's been reading many job adverts and most of them, including the consultancies, he noted that the organizations are not interested in the flesh blood at all. An advert that insists on master's or degree or even PhD with more than 10 years experience automatically disqualifies a young person, no matter how intelligent they are. And anyone below 45 years is automatically disqualified from such jobs. At what point will such organizations uh, benefit from fresh years, energy, highs, minds, and vibrancy possessed by the young people? Um, and he went further to ask if there's an organization with a clear succession plan, please let me have the 30 days. I really want to learn from them. And Charles, we are so grateful. Today we are seeing how Camp for Dev has shaped the narrative. And now we have the Camp for Dev Youth Leadership Forum, which even other organizations can come and learn from the work of the Camp for Dev as we develop the agenda together. And part of, to join this uh, team, part of the Camp for Dev Action Plan, there's a member action plan as an individual or even organization in uh, challenging this status quo and also decolonization of knowledge, you can decolonize the language where you can share perhaps knowledge management on sustainable development calls in line with the language um, from your local perspective for people to understand this and you provide solutions to the communities. In addition to that, uh, we have always witnessed how came for them, we, cele uh, we celebrate our home. Um, 
and also we share the inputs uh, with the locals. And finally, uh, we are always proud of him for the, the work that we are doing as community members and you're always loud and proud and I really love Kim for Dev. Um, to me it's like a home and it does become a home for many young people and also other upcoming professionals in the area of knowledge management for sustainable development calls. So yeah, may we continue to keep on being proud and loud of Kim for Dev and share to the locals and provide solutions uh, to the challenges that the communities are facing. And I'm happy to say, okay, but it has created a network also where we see now knowledge, um, wisdom, and also connecting with others. That yeah, it's no longer about where does this knowledge comes from. We have become a community where we see that yeah, it exists in every society, and it's not about from the global north or global south, but um, it is for all of our, all of our communities here. Thank you. I need now to hand over to Charles to take us through the next session. Welcome, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah and Gladys. And Gladys, thanks for reminding me about that quote. I'd almost forgotten about it. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. So, yes, this is a very important uh, conversation. I'm sure most of us, most of you, and um, most of the colleagues in Came for Dev are aware of the terms like formalizing the informal. There have been several efforts by big organizations like the World Bank. They've even written books about how do you formalize the informal sector, even the UNDP and others. Uh, if you look at it, it looks a very innocent process, but that's serious epistemicide. Because when you formalize a, a practice, you're actually shrinking some of its uh, avenues, some of its uh, nuances. So given that most African economies are relatively informal, not really inferior, but informal is not being inferior really. They are, they are oral, knowledge is shared orally. You don't have to write everything down. It's part of it is practice. And I see most of these practices in African markets where I've been working in for a very long time. Uh, that's where I see the efforts to sort of condemn these markets and say, no, they are not organized. They need to be registered. They need to have a CR14. They need to go to a company registration, and which is more about directors and a, a few people who then say we own the company. But now look, African economies don't function like that, which is where the whole notion of indigenous commerce comes in. Having looked at this, I said, maybe Formalizing the informal sector is not the solution. We need to really look at different ways of function. And this became very clear during the COVID-19 era, when we saw most of these indigenous uh, markets continue to function and feed people because of the lockdowns, which didn't allow some countries to import food. Countries started looking inwards, and they were looking at our own indigenous African markets. So that's where I realized that African commerce has been alive for many years. Perhaps doesn't need to be to be really formalized as well is what uh, other people think. Uh, so this is some of the terms. These are some of the terms that are borrowed from uh, Western commerce, where it's about a few value chains controlling food systems, a few people being the ones that really know where food is found, how to sell it. Our markets say no, no, no. Everybody has a role. So there's no barriers to entry. You can get into a market to get what you want. It doesn't matter how educated you are. You can still participate in an African market. Where the Western world says when you're above 70, you are you have retired, you need to go home. You are probably useless. African commerce said, no, you have a space. Young people can go and talk to you in the market. You give them knowledge. You share your experiences. So this is where we see the juxtaposition between African commerce, indigenous commerce, and the Western ways of dealing with markets. Another notion, again, is to do with the, how prices are set. There's consensus-based uh, uh, setting up of prices compared to the Western commerce, where only a few people can set prices. Maybe uh, big companies are the ones that can set prices for all, for all actors. It doesn't operate like that, where we have the wholesalers, retailers, and processors being the ones that dictate how food is shared. In the African sense, no, no, no. Uh, you, you find that... Otherwise, even the big corporates, they also learn a lot from the African commerce. So this is a whole ecosystem that has been existing on 
this on for a very long time. And uh, we have been studying it now uh, with my colleagues, Sarah and, uh, Kay and, and uh, Gladys. When I go to Kenya, most of the time I visit these markets, even if we go to West Africa, East, uh, East Africa, you almost see these markets they have a certain pattern, they have a certain way in which they deal with knowledge. Knowledge is, knowledge is handed over from generation to, the, to one generation to the other. Even if they don't have records written down, knowledge continues to really go on. And they have got a whole governance system, which is very important. It's not like there's a board, a board chairperson or something like that. Uh, there's a whole committee which runs this market. And some of it is very gender conscious. If you go to West Africa, most of the markets, there's a, there's a queen lady who really runs the market. In Southern Africa, there's a chairperson who can be a man or a, or a female. So these markets have evolved over years and they are so resilient. They are a very important part of our food system, although there have been attempts to suppress them, to say, no, let's create shopping malls, let's create supermarkets, let's just turn everything upside and down, because when we see food being traded in the street, it's dirty, it's not good, no. There is a whole, there's a whole knowledge system that drives this, this system. It's all about relationships, it's about trust, it's about a whole range of issues that we see that have been there for years. So where the uh, international world tries to assess the value of a, a, a business based on income and maybe on um, uh, balance sheets, our African commerce looks at what is used for what 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 is used for with the income that comes from the indigenous commerce. For instance, if you see a grandmother trading commodities for ten years, educating her children, that education in itself. That's the impact that you can see. You can't say, show us your records, how much money did you make over two years? No, no, no. Look at what she has done, how she has educated a child. So this is what we see in, in, in indigenous commerce. It's a, it's a rich, a diverse ecosystem that has been ignored. And we think it's high time that we really develop it. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful that with using knowledge management principles, we can probably be able to package this, to profile these ecosystems which are very important in the African sense. And perhaps the Western world can also learn a lot about how to be resilient. When I go to the Western world, I've started to see uh, that most of the economies are now driven by uh, SMEs. You hear that SMEs are playing a very important role. These are small companies, they are small businesses, no longer corporates. Of course, corporates are important, but they're not no longer as vibrant as they used to be because of how they think, how the economy is changing. The same applies to developing countries where we see our mass markets, and as well as SMEs are a big expression of indigenous commerce. So this is what we see and we think when we begin to document this and uh, produce some of the knowledge into books, then we, it's going to be learned in universities, which, is, which, which connects with what Sarah was saying about curricula. We need now to begin to see indigenous commerce as part of uh, a global curricula in universities, in schools. It should be started at the moment, is considered not, not, not knowledge. Really. We see most of our African universities and schools still studying uh, Western textbooks written in the 1960s, 1970s. Yet there's a whole lot of knowledge here, uh, oral knowledge, which is, which is waiting to be tapped in, waiting to be written. So the ball is in our court, myself and many others, maybe from my parts of the world. We still have a lot of work to do so that we document this knowledge so that it doesn't just disappear, or otherwise we will be accused of, being co of conniving with the epistemicide because we are letting our knowledge die waiting for someone else to come and sort it for us. Uh, in the interest of time, I will stop here. So this photograph here is, it was us in, it's, this is Nakawa market in Uganda. We're there end of, end of May with, it was me with some colleagues looking at uh, visiting one of the uh, indigenous commerce, centers of indigenous commerce in, in, in Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Gladys. Um, so during the presentations here, we had a few questions. And the first one that was from, uh, where did you go? Ariel Sophia Bardi. Um, and I think that was to you, Sarah, and that was with regards to the name of a journalist. And uh, I'm sorry, Ariel, I didn't actually quite catch the, um, the uh, uh the part in which you were referring to that so if you wouldn't mind uh unmuting yourself and and um recanting so to speak hi yeah thanks no i was just um there was a really interesting quote in one of the slides um and i was just looking for the attribution um 
because the presenter was mentioning, Sarah was mentioning it was part of, um, it was a journalist who had said it, but I, I just didn't catch the name. Thanks. So thank right. you. Thank you, Ariel. I, um, it was a journalist called Rebecca Solnit, and I'll put the link to the article in the, in the chat. It was a really great article because I was looking, I was looking for quotes about, you know, the pain of epistemic injustice and it obviously the people who are feeling it are mostly excluded and then I found this this article which was really really interesting I think so I'll, I'll go and look for it and pop it in the chat. Thanks a lot Sarah um, and then we also had a question from uh, bup, bup, bup. where did you go Nancy? Nancy Kwangwa um, regarding how one can join the mentoring group. And I think that was uh, aimed at you, uh, Gladys. So if you wouldn't mind, you know, sharing just quick how one might be able to become a member of said mentoring group, that would be much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, for those who would like to join the Camp for Dev uh, Youth Leadership Forum, it's always open. If you're a member of Camp for Dev, um, we will reach out to you, share your email, and then I will send you an invite. And perhaps these also have the opportunities if you want to engage with the camp for Dev. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys. So thanks for uh, three very interesting um, presentations. It's um, it's quite interesting, um, albeit you could also say a little bit concerning to see how uh, certain part, parts of the world they play a very active part in influencing. Uh, n local knowledge by introducing, for example, Western world of how we, for example, do uh, commerce over shattering, for example, the uh, indigenous uh, ways of commerce. Um, so what's interesting is, well, what I think is interesting is whether any of you have actually experienced this in any um, way or form yourselves already, or if it's something that you haven't thought about before until now, and if so, in what way? And the floor is wide open for any comments. Yeah, Gladys? Uh, thank you, Jacob. Maybe to respond to uh, what Charles was sharing in line to indigenous knowledge, um, since I joined the camp for Dev and learning how knowledge management can address various sustainable development goals. And when we look at it from the village perspective, we are still lacking behind. Even most of people, they don't understand what this is all about, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and one of the action plan that um, we did like kind of as an individual member and looking at what the camp for Dev is doing in decolonization of knowledge, um, Recently, we have come up with uh, an, an idea, an agenda about um, uh, village alumni, you know, and then like we need to go back to our village and give back to the community, empowering them on the importance of the indigenous knowledge. And now we have started uh, tracing various uh, trees, indigenous trees, and um, teaching the young people and also tapping this knowledge from the elderly people because it's fading away and it's dying. In regard to food security system, we are losing our knowledge, which is very relevant to what's in addressing um, food security that we are now facing at the moment. Um, in addition to that, other things that are perhaps maybe the scientific knowledge, like now one thing that uh, we observed from our villages that nowadays people use um, a pesticide to spray the soil, not like the way it used to be, and it's killing soil nutri nutrients because these communities are not aware about this. But unless as we go back to the community and for us to achieve SDGs 2030, we need to bring the care perspective and provide solutions. Um, other thing also, I have uh, we have championed this in our high school where we used to, and also these two primary schools that we have already uh, pioneered the project, which I'm so happy to see how it gets to. And looking forward to also to learning from some of us here who have already championed this. So it's a high time we restore back our indigenous knowledge and we need to share and even to be recognized even by the UN that yeah, 
without these SDGs, uh, without this indigenous knowledge, then definitely I'm worried we are not going to achieve the 20 that SDGs. Thank you, Jacob, over to you. Thank you very much. Just in time for us to head into the uh, aforementioned breakout rooms. So we'll, as I said before, have two sessions. Um, one where we'll be uh, sure, having a conversation about... Right, so uh, as I was saying, um, the first breakout room will be on epistemic justice relevant to each of your work. Uh, and the second one, uh, what can we do as KM uh, for Dev and international organizations. So if you will bear with me a minute, then we will also assign people. And there we go. All right. So second round. Have a good discussion, everyone. All right, welcome back everyone. And um, I think are people still trickling in or are we all here? I think we're all here. All right. So one of the uh, other fun parts of the session will be the discussion of the topics that we've, or questions that we've just gone over through in uh, those two breakout rooms. So I know that uh, some of the groups at least had some very interesting discussions and I'm um, quite keen to hear whether any of you else uh, in the other groups uh, had something interesting going as well with regards to what we can do as KM organizations and also whether epistemic justice is um, relevant to your uh, work. The floor is wide open. <laughs> In any case. Thank you, Jacob. I think you're just going to have to pick on somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick on uh, Mike Powell and, uh, and Peter, uh, Peter Burke, <laughs> if you guys don't mind. Um, and I'll, I'll try and set the stage in any case then. So what that was discussed here in there was basically that um, while um, we have a epistemic justice happening, then we should also not neglect to look at the uh, positive experiences, the uh, countermeasures being, uh, being uh, um, exercised or uh, done to combat it. Um, and yeah, Mike, uh, Peter, if either of you would like to uh, expand on it. Well, I, I thought the, the point going forward to how, how we take it forward as Cam for Dev and, and in our professional work is 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 but is, 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 is I'm wondering whether the, the term epistemic in, injustice or in another very active debate across much of academia the decolonization of knowledge is I'm wondering if these are the right ways of, of, of the best ways of framing it this isn't at all an argument against uh, saying there is and has been for centuries, epistemic injustice has been all forms of injustice for many centuries and they continue. But the, the main argument I, I would be making uh, professionally uh, is that the current knowledge arrangements aren't working very well. And we, we should be looking for effective knowledge on bringing people together to meet the world's challenge is, and you can't do that simply from a single perspective. Uh, and you can't do that without listening to other people who's, on whose cooperation you require, uh, you know, to, 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 to succeed. And so, if, you know, if we, I'm not without in any sense denying the, the coloniality or the injustice, uh, the, 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 the focus and particularly how we put it to managers and, and politicians is that this could be done a lot, lot better if we took a more open and equitable approach to these issues. Uh, and I, I, I would, I would put that, uh, that. I think that was my main sort of framing the debate uh, point that I was trying to make in our small group. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, Stuart. Uh, oh, sorry. Or any no, preference? I, very briefly, I, I, I fully uh, agree with Mike. Uh, 
and 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 uh, but um, it it depends on the context, right? I, where we as individuals or in groups in which organizations, uh, companies in which we work, we come about clear uh, epistemic injustice, then uh, that's where you start to raise awareness and, and, and show that this injustice exists. Um, but, but, but we have to go beyond that, of course, we have to show <laughs> how uh how to promote a, a justice and and what are concrete ways towards that and there i don't want to sound pessimistic at all but i don't know how to formulate it otherwise uh to me the the little i know from my professional experience that is incredibly complex it's not easy to overcome that because there are many, many parties at different power levels involved. And, and so it's probably a very slow process and, and, unless, you, unless you go for the French revolutionary approach, which in the end took a long time to really have some results. Thanks a lot, Peter. Sorry, uh, not not to bur uh, bury you, uh, Stuart, but I think it would also be uh, a good idea to hear from uh, some of our uh, female counterparts. Um, so uh, calling some of you guys out as well, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah, uh, Sarah Marie, uh, Cynthia or uh, Gabriella, just some examples. I was just going to say that um, I think I appreciate what you're saying, Mike, in terms of framing um, framing this in terms of what's possible um, if we do this work differently, if we learn differently. And at the same time, I think um, really what I'm hearing people talking about is the project of dismantling power. And um, I don't know that that can happen um, if we don't call out that power too and those power differentials, right? And if we don't clearly say, um, somebody has to give something up for things to change. And so I think that um, how we communicate that, right? Like even in the breakout groups, um, you know, we were talking, I was in a discussion with a couple of people about both land and um, fire management and learning from indigenous communities. And it means um, to engage um, with that indigenous knowledge means giving up your own um, claim to expertise. And so um, I think there's something in there about how do we, how do we have that conversation, especially for those of us who are white um, around sort of our responsibility and giving up our expertise and surrendering some of that power too. Um, so that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, Sarah, you may have a comment or an add on there. Yeah, I did, but maybe Stuart could go first because I know he had his hand up before. Oh, I just wanted to mention Pomolo, who is in our group, who, who made a fantastic insight about um, uh, mohair production and, and the knowledge required to deal with the diseases in sheep and goats. And he said that if you can fuse the Western knowledge and the Indigenous knowledge together, you, get, you don't get an addition, you get something even better. And that's what an awesome testimony, but we need to leave with those testimonies. And so I agree with Gabriella, we, we do need to look at dismantling some of this power. And I think humility is a big part of that. But sometimes us old white guys uh, can find a bit of humility when we realize that we can get access to free, better knowledge that's been around for hundreds of years and we didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> so maybe that's, uh, I was really impressed by Pomelo and his story because it, it gave me a bit of hope that if we focus on the synthesis, people might change their behaviors. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Um, am I now 
Jacob, am I now able to talk? Yeah. Okay. So the reason the reason I think like it's more urgent is I think that like I think we have to we I think we underestimate the pain and the distress that it causes individuals, communities, whole countries whose knowledge is not being seen as relevant. Like, you know, you know, and when I was looking, when I was looking for somebody who talked about this issue, I was, I was looking, I was talking to my dad on holiday and I was saying, I was looking for like what Cassandra said, you know, the, 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 um, the Trojan prophetess who nobody ever believed what, what she said about that. And he told me that was a form of epistemic injustice itself that I was trying to look for what uh, a sort of, you know, classical person said about this and that I should try and find something more relevant and more recent. And the only thing I could find was this one article, but like, this must be such an issue that, you know, nobody is listening to you. You can see, you know, your knowledge systems being destroyed, but nobody is listening to you. And I think we should, I think part of this thing is that we should try and listen. I mean, I think we do in lots of ways, but really imagine the pain that you must be going through if you're not being listened to, you know, when it's your own community, so that. And also I think we have a responsibility and that's why I really like this concept of like the taking part of the burden, explanatory burden. Like when we see, you know, we're not perfect, okay? But when we see racism or when we see people with a colonial mindset or sexism, all of us should try and call it out. And I'm not saying it's easy, but that's why I think it's really important because of the pain and the suffering and, you know, the death and everything that it must cause to people. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um quite a uh, strong statement, you could say. Um, I will also say that it will be the closing statement as we're more or, le more or less at uh, the end of the road for uh, this month's uh, Knowledge Cafe. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers and also very much all of our uh, participants. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do this. So thanks a lot for taking, to all of you for taking time out of your, uh, your days to participate in, uh, in this community. Um, with regards to upcoming events, on Thursday, the 11th of August, uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, Central European time, we will have a uh, knowledge cafe with uh, Pia Andrea Andrani on uh, youth in dialogues. We will be sending out some invites for that as well as we did with this one. Um, uh, and again, as the date is fairly close, it'll be happening within uh, the next uh, one to two days. Um, so keep an eye out, uh, look out for, for that email, and of course, uh, uh, register for it as we'd always like to see you participate in these events. Um, so with that being said, I would like to once again thank all of you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.